going to talk about debt today. You know there are bad debts, but there are also good debts. And not only these debts are good, but it is a debt will help you achieve the financial independence that you desire. Having good debt can make you rich. Don't believe it? Stick around in this and I'll show it to you. Let's go for it. In matters of debt, we can distinguish two types good debt and bad debt. Knowing the difference between the two types of debt will make you smarter and richer. And that's because if you spend your whole life working to pay debts and get credit, it will be very difficult for you to achieve financial freedom. And what it is worse, you will find yourself immersed in what is called the rat race. This is a term created by Robert Kiyosaki, the author of the book Rich Dad Poor Dad, which I have also summarized in this channel. It refers to the employee who is constantly in debt and struggling to pay off his or her debts. Needless to say, this is a very toxic situation that can affect your health both financially and physically. Well, let's start with bad debt. Basically, bad debt is debt that produces economic benefits only for the bank or entity that grants you the credit. Bad debt is debt that you pay. Look, you see, I am going to give you an example so that you understand. Remember assets and liabilities. If we compare the balances of assets and liabilities of the bank, and your assets and liabilities, it would look like this. If you ask for a credit to buy something, you generate bad debt. In your balance sheet it would be a liability that produces monthly expenses and for the bank it would be an asset that produces monthly income. Therefore, I want you to engrave in your heart this phrase when you incur debt, you become an asset for the bank. Bad debt is the one which has a very high interest rate and, of course, is contracted due to a lack of willpower. Let me explain. A person who wants a new car and wants the best car in the store, even though his old car still works perfectly. But he wants that one, and he wants it now, but doesn't have the money so he goes into debt. This is an example of bad debt. Another example of bad debt is debt that exceeds the useful life of the product. For example, financing a trip. Financing a one-week trip for one year makes no sense. In addition, psychologically it also affects you. Who wants to be paying for one year for a vacation that you almost don't even remember? Therefore, bad debt is that which is produced or generated by cravings, by lack of control. My recommendation is that if you want a car, an appliance or a trip, save to have it. If you enter into the dynamic of what I want right now, it will be very expensive in the future. And when I say expensive, I mean possibly sacrificing your future financial freedom. Still under bad debt there is a step down, a step down to hell. And that is toxic debt. The toxic debt, it is like the bad debt, but it is even worse since it is normally contracted on impulse, on a whim. It is allowed by very dangerous instruments such as credit cards, loan sharks, money lenders. These cards use a system that accumulates interest, at very, very high interest rates. It is like a compound interest, but here it goes against you. And this system can turn very small debts into very, very large debts. Well, we have already seen what bad debt is and how destructive it can be. Now it's time for good debt. Good debt has four main characteristics. The first characteristic is that good debt allows you to acquire assets that increase in value over time. An example is buying a house that will increase in value in the future. Or buying, for example, a classic car, antique, or an artwork that you know will increase in value in the future. Borrowing to buy assets is good debt. The second quality of good debt is that this debt generates income for you. For example, borrowing to attend a course or a master's degree is good debt. Since you will acquire more knowledge and you probably will be able to make economic use of this knowledge. A classic example is also acquiring a property and getting an economic benefit from that property. In that case, it is not bad debt, it is good debt, since you are acquiring a property from which you are benefiting economically. Another quality of good debt is that it benefits both parties. As we have said before that when you acquire bad debt, you benefit the bank since you are the asset of the bank with the good debt. The bank benefits because it charges you an interest, but you are getting an economic benefit from what you have bought. Therefore, you also benefit. In fact, there are times when even third parties benefit. Let me explain. Imagine that you buy a house to rent. The bank is benefiting because it is charging you interest. 
you are benefiting because you are renting that house to a third party and you are getting an economic benefit. And the tenant is also benefiting because he is accessing housing in a flexible and economical way. And finally, the most important quality of good debt is that you generate more profit for your investments. Gentlemen, I am aware that it will be a bombshell in the minds of many people, but there is a kind of debt that when you get into it, you earn more money. When you get into this debt, you become rich faster. And that is what I am going to explain next. You see, the poor when they borrow money, they go into debt. Whereas the rich when they borrow money, they leverage themselves. And that's just what I want you to understand. The principle of leverage. I want you to look at this picture. A rock, a solid rock. If you want to move this rock, you have two options. One is to move it with brute force, with your arms, with your legs, to move it, to push it, to drag it. And that, gentlemen, can take you a lifetime. The same time it takes a poor person to gather some money. But a rich person, an intelligent person, what he does is to leverage it. So, if we want to move this rock, we put a lever underneath and we make bigger force thanks to that lever. Remember Archimedes' most famous phrase, You know, give me a fulcrum and I will move the world. I want you to understand one thing. A poor person, a person with no financial education, his greatest aspiration in life is to pay everything in cash. He dreams of living without debt. He dreams of living without a mortgage. And that, in my opinion, is a mistake. A rich person, a person with financial intelligence, with good financial education, acquires debts and earns much more money, gets much more profitability with his money. Let's give an example. Imagine that we want to buy a place to rent. Okay, there are two ways, one is to buy it in cash with the money in hand and the other is to get into debt. We assume that in both cases we have the money in the bank and we do it in the following way. It is an apartment of $100,000 and we can get a monthly economic return of $600. Person who buys in cash puts the $100,000 to buy the apartment. If we multiply $600 by 12 months, we obtain an annual return of $7,200. In other words, we get a return of 7.2% for our money. Some of you may be thinking, well, 7.2% is not bad, is it? Well, let's look at the example of the person buying with debt. The person with debt prefers to finance the premises. Therefore, he gives a down payment of 20%. That is to say, he gives a down payment of $20,000. That is the capital he has tied up right now. He finances the other $80,000 with a mortgage at 3%. He has to pay every month $379 to the bank. As we have said, you can get $600 profit. Well, if we subtract from $600 the $379, we would have $221 clean per month for us. If we multiply it by 12 months, it would be $2,652 in terms of profitability. Because don't forget that the person who buys has immobilized the $100,000 and we only have immobilized the $20,000 of the entrance, the 20%. Therefore, we are obtaining a profitability of 13.2%, almost the double that of the person who buys in cash. But that is not the only thing. The person who buys in cash is at zero euros in the account and we, however, continue to keep $80,000 on it. And some will say, well, the person who buys has less profitability, but he does not have any debt already. But the person who has financed the purchase owes $80,000 to the bank. I agree but he has $80,000 in his account. If it is an apartment, there may be seasons that he isn't able to rent it. He has savings to be able to face the expenses. Besides those $80,000, you can invest them in some low risk financial asset. Let's say, for example, a 10 year bond that gives a 2% return and obtain an annual profit of 1,600 extra dollars to be able to amortize the mortgage or to be able to face different contingencies that may arise some of you will already say, that's true. But the person who has bought in cash hasn't had to pay interest. However, in the case of the debt, you have to pay more money in interest. But in the end, what counts in this type of operation is that you have less money tied up, that you are generating cash flow, and apart from that, of course, you have not decapitalized. 
this is because we are going to have $80,000 still in the bank and we are going to have room for maneuver to be able to start another business, to be able to buy another property or to do whatever we want. Because if we make a profit on those $80,000 with a bond or debt, shares, whatever you want, I assure you that we can cover those interests that we are paying. Also, I want to clarify some things. In this example, I have not taken into account what are the purchase costs, taxes, etc. But neither on one side nor on the other, in order to make it more simple and easier to understand. I want you to understand the epicenter of the message. I agree that by going into debt and doing things right you get more profitability, and the numbers don't fail. Another obsession of people who are not financially educated is to constantly want to get out of debt. However, a person with financial education gets used to living with debts and analyzes situations to see if it is profitable to end that debt. Because many times ending a debt makes us lose money. And if you don't agree, pay attention to this example. Imagine that we have a mortgage agreement. We owe $100,000 to the bank and we have 10 years left to pay. That is $10,000 a year of mortgage and by the grace of fate, suddenly we get $100,000. Either the lottery or an inheritance. Whatever, but we have $100,000. Here there are two options. One is to go to the bank and pay off the mortgage and have no mortgage at all. Many people, without hesitation, without seeing an alternative, would choose to pay off the mortgage. Let's look at this case, because you know like the previous example, we give the $100,000 or we stay fully capitalized. But what is the intelligent maneuver? What is the smart thing to do? Well, we have a mortgage of $833 per month, right? And we have $100,000 in our account. The smart move is to keep the house and keep the money. So what happens if we take that $100,000 and put it in a 10-year bond? A 10-year bond or any other asset that gives a normal return? Let's say for example a 2%. Every year we would have a profit of $2,000. And with those $2,000 we have two options. Either we allocate them to a monthly help to pay the mortgage. That way $833 of monthly bill would turn into $666 or we go to the bank, we deliver it at the end of the year and we reduce years of mortgage. In the first example we have the house paid, but we are at zero. It would cost us another 10 years to recover, and in the second example we keep the house, we have $100,000 in the bank and we have a totally controlled debt. Because gentlemen, if we owe $100,000 to the bank, but we have $100,000 in the bank ourselves. Where's the problem? we sleep very well, there is no problem. Therefore, in many cases it is preferable to maintain debts and not decapitalize ourselves. It is worth converting this type of debts into good debts, because, as we can see, money itself is an asset that also, depending on how we invest it, can generate cash flows, it can generate income per year. I have to warn that I have not taken into account in this example the taxation of the benefits of the bond or the shares that we buy, Okay, but I also have not taken into account some people who have mortgages and have bonuses in some countries for having a mortgage. Does the government give you help or do you have tax credits? The example is not in detail, but what I want is that you understand the idea. The fact that debt can become good, the fact that we can control debt and that can even be beneficial in some cases. It should be noted that we must also be careful with leverage and under no circumstances incur in over leverage. To explain the concept of over leverage I will give a very graphic example in a minute for you to understand. If we want to buy a property to rent it, and we are asked for a 20% down payment, then we give those $20,000 and we buy the house and we keep the capital. At the moment that we are paying that debt, we are also releasing capital. Because we owe less money to the bank and therefore, we can even enter or we can consider entering into another debt. We can value another financial operation, that is leverage and that is healthy. Over leveraging is quite another thing. Over leveraging is incurred by people who overextend themselves. For example, in the mortgage crisis, that is, in the real estate bubble of the 2000s, what did people do? Well, yes, with 20% they said I can buy a house because they asked me 20% to buy a house, that is $20,000. 
in this case I divide the 100,000 in 5 entries and I can buy 5 houses. You will say great. As long as they give you the rents, the 5 houses, you have a brutal cash flow. But what happened? The real estate market collapsed. There were no more people to rent to. The crisis came and suddenly people had a brutal debt of half a million, because they were over leveraged. And there were people who even owed the bank a million, two million, etc. In other words, it was a horror movie. They had even put their loved ones' properties as guarantee. Therefore, all the families were falling like dominoes. As you can see, bad debt, what it does is to finance whims and momentary desires. Whereas good debt allows you to buy assets. Bad debt ruins you and good debt benefits you. Bad debt benefits only one of the two parties and good debt benefits both parties, and even third parties. The bad debt puts you permanently in the rat race, and good debt makes you richer every day. If you are going to incur in debt, consider all the points in these two columns. If you're watching this video, it means you want to thrive in your financial education and you're smart enough to know if a debt is good or bad. And that's it for today. Thumbs up if you found this video useful. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you don't miss any video. And remember, smart work is the key to success.